Amen. We're going to um, read a few verses tonight from 2 Peter chapter 3. And uh, we begin at verse 1. And our, our thoughts will focus mainly on verse 2, but uh, we will be directed not only to, but also by verse 10. So we we'll read the first um, verses of the chapter down to verse 11. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 1 to 11. Beloved, I now write to you the second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Saviour. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct? and godliness. Amen. We end our reading there at verse 11 and uh, we'll return to consider uh, some of these truths as we go through our little study. Uh, it is interesting just to note in the passing that having posed that very pertinent and uh, very important question in verse 11, in relation to holy conduct and godliness. And that becomes the measure uh, upon which we examine our own hearts and lives. How do we match up to the life of holy conduct and godliness? Um, in verse 12, uh, we move further through to the anticipation of the second coming of Christ, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. And that's a, a, a unique position and it's a challenging one there in verse 12, for we're exhorted to live a life that exhibits the attitude of our heart, which is a twofold attitude. One, we are looking for and then the second is, we are hastening the coming of the day of the Lord. And that, that uh, reminds us 
that it's not only the spread of the gospel and the bringing in to the kingdom those who are unconverted and yet they wait as it were for that moment of inspiration and illumination uh, that will bring them to saving grace numbered amongst the elect of God uh, they're still not within the fold other sheep I have which are not yet of this fold them also I must bring and there shall be one fold and one shepherd and uh, the thought here is that the more we look for and the more earnestly we pursue holiness then we are in a sense working towards the coming day of, uh, of the Lord so the challenge is um, is there for us now we return um, to where our study left off last uh, Wednesday night uh, centered particularly on the second verse and uh, here we are reminded that uh, Peter has this sense of responsibility that links in with a sense of urgency. He knows what he needs to do and what those that he is writing to need to do. And with that sense of responsibility and passing that message on, he also recognizes that there is a, an urgency about it. We cannot afford to sit back, to wait, to linger, and as it were, to leave the work to others. We all need to be involved. So uh, Peter has been warning, as we have noted on a number of occasions, of the danger of false prophets and false teachers. He has carried that through from the first part of uh, chapter 2. And he still has that theme running through his mind and lying upon his heart. But he wants to elevate and also to uh, accelerate this thought by putting it into the context not only of the last days, but particularly that of the coming day of the Lord. For within the scope of the end times or the last days, there are particular standout moments or, if you like, displays of the finality of the fulfillment of the purpose of God. So there will be particular events that will highlight the entire process. And uh, Peter brings it all into that statement in verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Now in that one reference, that one text, there are a number of key features that will be evidenced in that final period of time, that final process. And uh, we find ourselves in all kinds of difficulty with uh, Scripture if we fail to understand the scope of that verse. There are many who would uh, believe and would teach that all of this happens at the same time, that it is describing one and the same event. But if you look closely, you will notice that there are contradictions in the text if that is the understanding of the interpretation. For example, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Then we read, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. So we're looking here at two separate events, not the one. On the one hand, 
there is a quiet gathering in or drawing out or catching up of the people of God, the church of God, the elect of God. He will come as a thief in the night. Then there is uh, that uh, consequence that follows, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Now that cannot be associated with the coming of the thief and the snatching away of the church. That is a different event. Uh, and uh, we fit that in, of course, to the occasion when having taken the church home, preparing the church, then Christ will come with his church or with his elect back to earth. That's when he will stand upon the Mount of Olives and this second phase will be brought into play. Now, this is the concern of Peter that those who in particular are arguing against the teaching of the church, that is by and large the false teachers and the false preachers, that they have failed to properly understand the calculations of Scripture. They are talking, if you like, about a subject that they know and understand little or nothing about. That's why often if you are confronted by someone from a sect or a false cult or religion, if you get them off their prescribed line of thought or reasoning, they cannot, they cannot answer in terms of the broader concepts of Scripture simply because they do not understand. They have a framework of patterned ideas and uh, they have been taught how to make an approach but get them off that subject and they have no understanding of the rest of Scripture. Well, that's the argument now that Peter is bringing into the church in relation uh, to these false teachers. And he is doing that uh, right at the beginning of this third chapter where he uh, sets out clearly what his objective is. I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. Now that immediately suggests that Peter is not going to rely solely upon his knowledge of this uh, teaching of Scripture. He wants to remind them of the historical as well as the spiritual concepts that have already been laid out for them. And you'll see how he develops that in verse 2 that you may be mindful, and he now explains what he means by stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. So right into the Old Testament, in the heart of the Old Testament, is the confirming promise that relates to the day of the Lord. So Peter is saying, even if um, I was not here, even if I was not in a position to teach you, you ought to know. What you need to do is to remember the words, the teaching of the prophets. And in the teaching of the prophets, you will see clearly uh, the position in relation to this promise of Christ's coming. Then, um, having looked at that in a previous study or two, 
We note uh, also in verse 2 uh, that he then brings this prophetic word through from the Old Testament scriptures into the setting of the New Testament. And he does that by simply adding, and of the commandment of us. He chooses and he uses a slightly different approach as he brings in that word commandment. You see, the promises of God are not only reassurances, but they are also commandments. See, every promise demands a response. And that response is a response of faith. Do we believe or do we not? So when God gives us a promise, with that promise comes the challenge of obedience. And uh, in that obedience there is the, not only the instruction, but there is the challenge of command. And of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Saviour. And the word apostles, as we know, differs from the word disciples. There were 12 apostles, there were many disciples. The word disciple relates to a learner, a student, if you like. So the responsibility of the disciple was to learn and then to respond and to obey, to put into operation what they learned. But the, the word apostle has a different thought and it represents those who have been called in order to be taught and trained and then commissioned as they are sent out to bring that message to others. So here is the message of the apostles. That you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles. And here is the bottom line of the Lord and Saviour. So just as the prophets spoke under the direction of God in the Old Testament, the apostles now speak under the direction of Christ in the New Testament, under the New Covenant. You remember how that in John chapter, sorry, Acts, chapter 1, when uh, the disciples were asking about the coming kingdom, is now the time when you will bring in the kingdom? And Jesus said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own hands, but you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. And so the New Testament reveals the witness to Jesus, the apostles called, equipped, and then sent forth to bear the message of the gospel, the message of, uh, of Jesus. So in the context of this chapter, the commandment and the message or the ministry of the apostles relating to the Lord and Saviour has at its heart the day of the Lord. For the day of the Lord is pictured as being that final consummation of everything that God has purposed in his heart. It is uh, revealed throughout Scripture as being our final salvation. And uh, that is the, the thrust of the thought that Peter is bringing to us in what will be his uh, final comment as we are now in the last chapter of his second epistle. 
So he points to the message of the prophets in relation to the day of the Lord, and uh, he reminds us also of the role of the apostles as they promote the theme of Christ's return. So let's just take this uh, for a few moments, break down the order uh, in which this appears. You will notice in verse 2 that they are regarded as the apostles of the Lord and Saviour. So that means that as they go out, they do not speak in their own name, they speak on behalf, you shall be witnesses unto me. Now, if we were to relate that to the teaching of Jesus in John 14, 15, and 16, you'll recall there how he sets out very clearly, uh, Jesus does, sets out very clearly that on his return to the Father, he will send another comforter, or the word there is paraclete, the word literally means one called alongside to help. So that means that whatever the need may be at any time, the Holy Spirit will supply the grace, the power, the authority that is required to meet that need. In relation to that direct ministry of mediation, if you like, between God and man, the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, would take off the things relating to himself and make them known to us. He also added, he will glorify me. So the work of the Holy Spirit is to make Jesus more real, more precious, more intimate to us so that we in turn may reflect his image, his likeness, his glory more and more. So the position of the believer, the child of God, as we are placed in this world, is that we become a good example of the grace of God transforming lives into things of glory, promoting and projecting the glory of Jesus. So everything we do should speak of him. Everything we say should speak of him so that others will know that we belong to him. We are his. Now to set this into motion in this uh, chapter, if we're to understand the word of the apostles in relation to the day of the Lord, as outlined in verse 10, we need to begin with the Lord and Saviour. Now, we know that there are many illustrations throughout the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that set out for us the teaching of Jesus in relation to his second coming, to the end times. One of those, um, and perhaps the best known, and uh, perhaps the most enlightening of all, are those uh, two chapters in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24 and 25, where in response to three very specific questions, Jesus gives very specific answers. So let's just go over to Matthew chapter 24, and we'll pick out a few relevant and appropriate references without uh, going through the entire passage. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24. 
Uh, just to introduce the, uh, the passage, Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So there are three questions there, and Jesus now answers. And note how he begins. Jesus answered and said to them in verse 4, Take heed that no one deceives you. You see, when you read through the rest of this chapter and into chapter 24, you'll find that at the heart of most of these signs or illustrations is deception. And that's why the early church were so taken up with this concept of false teachers and false preachers and false prophets, because Jesus very clearly warned that this would be a common problem. We're going to be uh, noting uh, on Sunday morning, God willing, how uh, orthodox religion came about, where it began, how it started, and how it became the scourge of the children of Israel, and how it continues to be that right to this day. And that's why we are told that we need to come out from among her and be separate and touch not the unclean thing. And that's why there are three chapters in Revelation that are taken up by describing the system that will be largely in operation uh, leading up to the coming of Jesus. And we need to be aware of it. And these things are happening around us uh, even while we speak. But uh, notice... Uh, how Jesus goes on to speak of, in particular, our theme tonight, the day of the Lord, is um, coming judgment. So let's go down to verse 6, and we'll read through from verse 6 to verse 10. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. See, many are becoming concerned that what's happening in the Middle East today is an indication that Christ is on his way. He is just about to switch out the lights of heaven, lock the doors, and come down to bring his judgment upon the earth. Well, Let's just hold back a little because Jesus here said these things must come to pass but the end is not yet. I don't know if you caught on the news um, today. You might be thinking I watch an awful lot of news but uh, I am selective. I, I, I know what, what news to watch in order to get the most benefit and I don't spend a lot of time looking at the news because there's no good news around these days. But I'm sure you've heard the latest today how that America stopped Israel. These weren't bombs that were be used to destroy Israel, but these were bombs that were to help Israel in the conflict in Gaza and America stopped the shipment from arriving. 
Now, is this not a further indication that all the nations of the world are getting agitated with Israel? Even the friendly nations are beginning to lose heart and beginning now to turn against Israel. Now, we're not surprised at this because Bible prophecy is full, saturated with that particular point. Israel will be on her own. The reason being, Israel has got to learn that her help is in the Lord alone. No other, no other nation can't go down into Egypt for help. No surrounding nations will want to stand with Israel at the end. They will have to trust in the Lord. Now here we, uh, we read, look at verse 7. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All of these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. What is it that's irritating the nations around Israel? Is it not Israel's arrogance that they have God on their side? What is it that's keeping Israel in the battle? Is it not their confidence that God is on their side? So in this little thought here, for my names sake. You see, they're not fighting against Israel for the sake of fighting against Israel. This is an assault upon the citadel of heaven. This is an assault upon God. And then many will be offended and will betray one another. Just take a walk around universities anywhere in the world today and what do you find? Friends falling out. Not just getting upset with each other, but literally falling out and uh, becoming, as it were, enemies and will hate one another. You see, Jesus has spoken clearly about the end times. Then come down into verse uh, 20. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And we need to note the setting of uh, this verse. Um, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. Jesus is not referring, as in other passages when he confirmed that the people of this generation will not pass away before these things happen. And everybody began to think that Jesus was speaking about the generation of his time the generation he was addressing. But in the context of these passages, Jesus is addressing those of the generation who live in the time that he has described. Not his time, but that generation that will be alive at the end uh, in that period. And so when we look back at the like of the Holocaust and say, well, that was the worst time ever, and that relates to this. That's not what this reference or this text is suggesting. It is simply telling us that even the Holocaust, as horror-filled as it was, will not compare to the tribulation that will come at the end times. 
nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it, for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Now, here is a key text. See, I have told you beforehand. So, Peter is writing his epistle and he is saying to them, I want to stir up your mind. I want you to remember. Remember what? Remember that Jesus told us what would take place before his return. We need to remember that and hold on tenaciously in faith. And then the last verses in this passage, let's go to verse 29 and 30. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Does that not sound a little bit familiar? We have just read that, have we not, in the 10th verse of Second Peter chapter 3. A thief in the night. And then the heavens will be shaken. A great noise. And here Jesus is referring to it. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So Peter is telling us, remember the teaching of Jesus. Let's not slacken the pace. Let's not loosen our grip. Let's not become apathetic and question whether or not the Lord is coming. Let's not get involved in the arguments of theologians trying to work out how and when and in what manner Christ will return. The matter that concerns us that we need to be laboring in our own heart is what manner of persons ought we to be in light of the fact that Jesus is coming soon and we need to be living in that anticipation of faith. Now, time has uh, run its course again tonight. It seems to be that we're going to have to get a new clock for the room here, one that goes slow and not fast, just so that we can fit in all we want to cover in the Bible study. But God willing, we shall return next Wednesday evening uh, and continue through with this uh, little study. And I do have a, an announcement to make in that regard. Uh, and I will repeat this, of course, on Sunday morning. But uh, next Wednesday night, we have been notified that uh, there will be a power outage here at the church and in this uh, immediate vicinity uh, and it will affect quite a number of things and we don't want to have to conduct a Bible study in the dark or under torchlight or candlelight. So what we uh, propose to do is that we will commence our Bible study next Wednesday night at 6.30 instead of 7.30 and we will conclude at 7.30. So we begin at 6.30, we go through to 7.30, and then 
we let you all go home so that you're nicely secured in the safety of your own homes before they turn out the lights. So next Wednesday night, Bible study will commence at 6.30. It will be live streamed, so if you're not able to get here that one hour earlier, then don't, uh, don't panic. You will still be able to tune in to live stream and uh, we will have our study per usual. Thank you again for joining with us tonight, either here or through our live stream program. We pray that you have been encouraged and challenged through our little study tonight and that together as we move towards the coming of Jesus that we will have hearts filled with anticipation as we look forward to meeting him face to face. Let's have a, a little prayer as we close. Our loving Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its relevancy in our time and in our generation. We often hear the questionings, the arguments, the concerns of many around us who are wrestling and grappling with these profound truths of Scripture. And yet you have told us that your word is so simple, even a child who has been gifted, the gift of faith, will be able to understand their need of a saviour and in simple trust lay hold upon your promises of forgiveness and of grace. And we pray that you will continue to enlighten our minds with that wisdom that comes from above so that we will be prepared, made ready, for that day when we hear the shout, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. We pray that you will encourage us in your word and in the exhibition, the exhibiting of that word through practical concerns and interests and desires so that we will grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Be with those at home, those who may be travelling in the car, those who are joining with us in fellowship this hour. Bless them where they are. Encourage them in the daily routine of their lives and bring us together once more safely and securely, covered by the precious blood of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.